In the last episode of this series, we showed how the interaction of gravity with electromagnetism and plasma phenomena led to the generation of a hierarchy of structure from superclusters of galaxies down to stars. This process ends with the generation of stars. The formation of stars produces a new stage in cosmic evolution because stars are dense enough to produce large amounts of fusion energy. Now, the plasma between the stars is hot enough for fusion reactions, but the first fusion reactions that occur between hydrogen nuclei, protons, occur very slowly. They're very rare events because they involve the spontaneous conversion of a proton to a neutron when two particles are close enough to interact. Now, in the depths of space, these events are so rare as to be negligible. It's only at densities as great as the density of stars, which is about the same amount of density as solid material here on Earth, that the collisions become common enough so that eventually lots of fusion energy is produced. This is still a slow process, but over billions of years, stars produce thousands of times more fusion energy than the gravitational energy that went into the formation of the stars. We'll discuss further this stage of cosmic evolution in the next episode of this series. There's abundant observational evidence that this description of the formation of structure is correct, unlike the Big Bang story. First of all, as we said in the first episode of this series, we see these filaments at all scales in the universe. We see them in our laboratory devices at the scale of centimeters. We see them on the scale of light years in the clouds that form uh, stars like our own sun. We see them on million light year scales in filaments that form galaxies like the Milky Way. And we even see them on scales of hundreds of millions of light years where clusters of galaxies are strung like beads on a string along these huge filaments. Second of all, the theory made quantitative predictions that were confirmed by subsequent observations, which, as we've emphasized, is the key test of a validity of a scientific theory. First of all, papers that I wrote in 1986 showed that the density of the universe, because of its fractal structure, depends on the scale at which this density is measured. So as the scale you measure it gets larger, the density gets smaller because there's structure at all scales. Quantitatively, the density gets smaller as the square of the distance on which the density is measured. Mathematicians like to call this a fractal of dimension two. Subsequent observations discovered that that's exactly what we observe in the universe. Second, observations confirmed the prediction that objects actually exist, structures actually exist, up to the scale of four or five billion light years. This completely contradicts the predictions of the Big Bang, which predicted that no such structures could form because there wasn't enough time in the 13 billion years since the Big Bang. Third, the theory predicted that structures at all scales would have rotational velocities that didn't exceed about 1,000 kilometers per second. Again, this prediction has been abundantly confirmed by observation. Combined with the other predictions, this also predicted a hierarchical structure in which the rungs of the ladder were closer at the top than at the bottom. So, for example, a galaxy is separated from another galaxy typically by 
approximately 100 times its radius. But stars are separated from other stars by 10 million times their radius. Now, this process of filament formation that we see in the universe is also critical to the production of fusion energy here on Earth. In all plasmas that are hot enough to produce fusion energy, these filaments spontaneously form. Now, in most fusion devices, the filaments are treated as undesirable because they help the plasma to wriggle out from the confinement of the external magnetic fields. But we at LPP Fusion are using a different approach, the device we call, uh, that's called the dense plasma focus, where we actually imitate nature and use these filaments to concentrate the plasma to the point where we get rapid fusion energy production. Now, since we don't have gravitational fields being significant at laboratory scales, we actually use the shape of the electrodes to concentrate the fields of the filaments. And since we don't have gravitational energy as the source of the currents, we use energy stored in capacitors. In our experimental device, the electricity that charges these capacitors comes from the grid. But in a fusion generator that we are working to develop, the energy will come from the previous pulse of the device itself. Standing in for a galaxy is a vacuum chamber with some gas on the inside and two electrodes, the negative cathode on the outside, the positive anode on the inside, separated by a ceramic insulator. When fast switches initiate the current, electrons start to flow vertically across the insulator from the cathode to the anode. The same pinch forces that operate in the cosmos pull the current together into filaments, which we and many others have observed with this device. The interaction of the electric currents with the magnetic field they produce accelerates the filaments outwards to the cathode veins and down the anode to its hollow tip. As in the center of a galaxy, the currents are forced by the shape of the anode to turn first to head inward to the center, then to turn along the axis, where, as in a galaxy, they pinch together into one more powerful filament. Just as in the astrophysical case, the filament then kinks up into a tiny plasmoid. The net result is to compress and heat the plasma many-fold until fusion and reactions start to take place. Since we can't wait around for billions of years for the ultra-slow fusion reactions to occur with pure hydrogen, we instead use more reactive fuels, deuterium or hydrogen with boron. With these fuels, reactions take billions of a second instead of billions of years because they're driven by the strong nuclear forces between nucleons which hold the nuclei together, not the weak nuclear force which turns protons into neutrons. So here we're improving considerably on nature. Finally, as the plasmoid decays, it shoots out the beam of the ions in one direction and electrons in the other, just like the vastly larger beams produced by Herbig Harrow objects and quasars. In our DPF device, the ion beam will carry away most of the energy produced by the fusion reactions, enabling us to change that energy back to energy in electrical circuit at high efficiency. The similarity of the astrophysical and DPF processes is not coincidental. Those like Dr. Winston Bar Bostick and Dr. Vittorio Nardi, who pioneered the development of the DPF, were deeply involved in the effort to mimic the creative processes of the cosmos in the laboratory. Althane had pioneered the idea that only by understanding the cosmic processes could fusion and other energetic processes on Earth be understood. And my own contributions to the theory of the DPF were based on using it as a model for quasars. In the next episode of this series, we'll discuss the phase of cosmic evolution 
that's driven by thermonuclear reactions and stars. That's the phase we're in right now, and it's produced all the chemical elements that we consist of, and also the cosmic microwave background.